Welcome to the May Ultrasound Case of the Month. Thanks once again for taking the time to watch clinical cases and learn how ultrasound can assist us all in taking care of patients. My name is Greg Zahn and I'm an Assistant Professor of Clinical Emergency Medicine. Please email me with any questions or concerns at gzahn.iu.edu. This case was seen by the resident Dr. Christine Motzkus and the attending Dr. Bart Biesinger. The case starts at a small rural hospital where a 32-year-old female was transported to the hospital by medic for onset of left flank pain in the setting of approximately a two-week history of cough, fatigue, and easy bruising. She was known to be moderately agitated upon arrival and documented to be writhing in the bed. Her vitals were obtained and were remarkable for tachycardia and relative hypotension. Soon after arrival in the room, the patient experienced what was documented as a possible syncopal versus seizure episode. She lost consciousness, yet soon improved with painful stimuli. The treating provider did evaluate the patient soon after and on physical exam was found to be ill-appearing and anxious with a documented GCS of 12. She was tachycardic with dry, cool skin. Her abdomen was described as soft yet tender. As stated previously, she was writhing in bed. Repeat vials displayed a systolic blood pressure in the 80s and fluid resuscitation was initiated. Additionally, she was given medication to help with her agitation. Given the atypical presentation, extensive imaging and laboratory studies were obtained. Labs returned a short time later and were remarkable for a white blood cell count of 132,000, a hemoglobin of 5.5, and a platelet count of 16. There was some difficulty with getting the patient to the scanner, given her agitation. In order to get the patient to scan, morphine and Ativan were given. The patient was subsequently taken to the CT scanner, where the patient lost pulses and a code was called. Active resuscitation ensued, including initiation of blood products. The patient was intubated and moved back to the ED without completion of imaging. Return of circulation was achieved, but the treating providers astutely realized the patient surpassed the capabilities of their small hospital. Emergent transport was arranged to the local quaternary care center, where she arrived intubated with her six unit of PAC cells running. Shortly after arrival, the patient was found to be pulseless and ACLS protocol was initiated, along with rapid transfusion protocol. In addition to PAC cells, platelets and FFP were given. Ultrasound was utilized during pulse checks with cardiac activity identified. After a prolonged code, the treatment team did regain palpable pulses. It was clear from the outside hospital workup that the patient had an acute leukemic process. However, it was less clear why the patient suffered the initial and subsequent arrest. No advanced imaging was able to be completed, and the treatment team decided to look for additional causes to explain the patient's profound shock state. Immediately upon scanning the abdomen as part of a rush examination, this view was obtained. This is a view of the patient's right upper quadrant, also known as Morrison's pouch. Fluid on ultrasound is dark, and there is a large amount of dark hypochoic area noted in this video. In a normal healthy patient, fluid should not be evident. In this case, the fluid clearly represented a large amount of hemoperitoneum. Although this finding is not subtle, to further highlight the abnormality, I color-coded a screenshot of the video clip to help with interpretation. As you can tell, there is blood surrounding the liver tip. The left upper quadrant, also known as the perisplenic view, was subsequently imaged. Fluid is seen in this region, superior and surrounding the spleen. The junction of the spleen and the kidney can be seen. It is important to appreciate this relationship because people often generalize that free fluid forms between the liver and the kidney and also between the spleen and the kidney. However, fluid tends to first form superior to the spleen between it and the diaphragm. In order to farther clarify anatomy, I once again color-coded a still shot of the ultrasound video to help orient and depict relevant anatomy. While we don't see a clear view of the diaphragm, it would be on the left side of the image superior to the spleen. The final fast view obtained was the pelvic view. While the bladder is not clearly evident, we can see a large amount of fluid surrounding loops of bowel. Anytime you see fluid that is separating and demarcating bowel, this represents a large amount of free fluid and is in no way consistent with physiologic fluid. The color diagram helps differentiate the free fluid from the loops of bowel that are being surrounded by blood. Given the new information of massive hemoperitoneum as a potential cause or contributing factor in the patient's shock state, the surgery service was emergently consulted. Initially, the patient was too unstable for the OR given her ongoing CPR, yet once circulation and relative stability was obtained, the surgery service took the patient for an exploratory laparotomy. Upon entering the abdomen, they suctioned approximately 7 liters of blood, a ruptured spleen was identified and the patient underwent a splenectomy and distal pancreatectomy. 
Even with aggressive interventions in the OR, the patient remained profoundly ill. She coded upon leaving the OR. ROSC was achieved, yet the patient was profoundly coagulopathic and required nearly constant push-dose pressors. Oxygenation was an issue even with maximal interventions. Given this clinical picture, the care team counseled family and the patient subsequently expired soon after arrival in the ICU. Before I get into specific ultrasound learning points, I wanted to clearly express that this was an extremely unfortunate case with an obvious bad outcome. The patient had a bad disease process and arrived in extremis to the outside hospital, making diagnosis nearly impossible. However, what we do in medicine is look for ways to continually improve, and I feel that highlighting ultrasound's ability in this case can potentially help future patients. While ultrasound can be useful in many settings, my particular interest in ultrasound has always been its ability to assist in settings where our usual tools are not available given patient acuity. This case represents such a setting where the patient was critical and advanced imaging was not feasible. The treating providers astutely utilized ultrasound to help differentiate an unclear situation. In these cases, the concept of a rush examination has been widely discussed for a number of years. Rush stands for rapid ultrasound and shock. There have been many variations of ways of teaching this exam, yet I like to simplify things. I think the most common sense simplification is to think about hypotension in a sense of the pump, the tank, and the pipes. The blue stars represent the usual probe locations to complete this study. This can seem overwhelming if you've never learned of the rush examination before, Yet we will attempt to simplify things, and depending on the patient presentation, I highly recommend you use your clinical skills and experience to hit where you think are the highest yield scans. It's pretty obvious, yet the pump means looking at high yield views of the heart, specifically looking for pericardial fusion, indicative of tamponade, looking at the left ventricular ejection fraction, which allows determination of poor cardiac function, which could be playing a role in the hypotension, and next look at the right side of the heart for evidence of strain, which could be indicative of a massive PE. I like to visualize the tank as the two large compartments of the body where blood can collect. These compartments are the thorax and the abdomen. This concept should be well appreciated because it represents the majority of the EFAS examination. Evaluate the thorax by placing the probe anteriorly, looking for pneumothorax represented by a lack of sliding. I like to look for hemothorax by sliding my probe superior after obtaining my hepatorenal and splenic views as part of my FAS examination. The abdominal views were abnormal in this case, with all three views showing free fluid. And last but not least, looking at the pipes. Look at the aorta for signs of aneurysm or dissection. Look at the IVC as a marker of volume status. Additionally, in the right clinical setting, potentially looking at the lower extremities for signs of DBT if cardiac examination is inconclusive or concerning for right heart strain. Don't let the number of potential areas to scan intimidate you. I will hardly ever perform every component of the rush examination. I pick and choose based on my clinical suspicion and what would potentially change my management of the critical Ill patient. Like this case, I have seen it utilized in critical situations where it changed management or decision as part of resuscitation. Thanks once again for watching. Continue using ultrasound to help take care of your patients and email me with any questions or concerns.